For whomever finally wins this epic, unprecedented, and too often gross U.S. presidential election, a world in flux awaits. Russia, China, Europe, and the Middle East each present new complications that will test and possibly define the world order to come. Derek Shearer is former U.S. ambassador to Finland and currently director of the McKinnon Center for Global Affairs at Occidental College in Los Angeles, California. He's been a foreign policy advisor to former Vice President Al Gore and to Hillary Clinton when she was the senator from New York State. And he joins us now to examine what lies ahead for U.S. foreign policy, and it's a delight to welcome you to our studio. Thank you, Steve. I want to know, when you talk about the current U.S. election with your international contacts, what do they say about what they think this campaign reflects about your country? Well, what they first ask is, have Americans gone crazy? You know, what is this? And what I've been trying to do <clears throat> when I've been giving talks about this campaign around the world is to explain that while it may seem to be one of the weirdest, strangest, the word you used, grossed campaigns in recent American history, there are actually big issues at stake. And it's also singular in that it's the first time we have a woman nominated who may become the first woman president. And it's the first time we have a businessman slash reality TV star who's never held public office as the nominee from the other party. And these are firsts in American history. How do you explain his appeal? His appeal is that he has a narrative about the world. And one of my arguments is that this is the first campaign about globalization. And by that, I mean that Trump explains globalization and he has good guys and bad guys, mainly bad guys, mm -hmm. and he has solutions. And so the, to people who feel that they are either not benefiting from the current situation or are angry about aspects of it, like immigration, he tells a story. And so his story, which is, I'll just quickly summarize, is, OK, America has been taken to the cleaners by globalization. So we've had all these unfair trade pacts, NAFTA, worst trade pact in history, allowing China and the WTO. These countries take our jobs. Case of Mexico, they send us rapists and criminals. So we're being eaten alive by the global economy, hurts our workers. And the immigrants come in, legal and illegal. They take the jobs of hardworking Americans. In some cases, they might be in, quote, terrorists, especially if you take them from the Middle East. And Donald Trump has solutions. Build a wall with Mexico. And that resonates with f some 40% of your population? Well, here's the way it worked. It resonated very extremely well with 5%. That's how many people voted, 5% of American voters for him in the primary. What he's managed to do so far is increase that 5% to near 40% because he is not an exception, generally, to the Republican Party. What he's done is taken many arguments the Republican Party has been making over the years, especially, sadly, an argument that involves race. It's just that previous Republicans have not used the same harsh language. But remember, Donald Trump became most well known, other than for being on The Apprentice, by attacking the first African-American president, Barack Obama, claiming that he was born in Kenya, mm. not a citizen and not a Christian. Now, that's clearly a racial appeal, but he doesn't quite say it that way. He said he was doing a favor to America to clear this up. Uh, so there is a racial aspect because, sadly, the Republican Party has become the party of white people. Let me put you back on to foreign affairs here. Yeah. And to do that, uh, let's share these numbers from this survey. Uh, Pew Research, April 2016, how involved should the U.S. be with the rest of the world? 57% say deal with our problems first, 37% say help other countries. Do you think Americans have had it with foreign policy? I don't think they've had it. And I, you know, I've read a lot of these polls. People, Americans don't want to disengage from the world. They don't want America to be the world's policeman. They particularly don't want to be involved in endless wars in the Middle East. That's absolutely clear. And that's why <clears throat> President Obama has reduced troops in the Middle East, not increased it, and why he's avoided putting ground troops in Syria. It is also true that we have not had nuanced, subtle discussions of the benefits of international trade. Uh, and in fact, trade's a dirty word in our campaign right now. You can't talk about it. Hmm. And so I think that there are significant numbers of people who feel as if 
what I call hyperglobalization. It's kind of out of control. And what they want to do is slow it down and think about it. And they don't want to throw out all foreigners because we're an immigrant-based nation anyway. They don't want to erect giant walls, but they want a government that understands that they are concerned about it. And they, you know, Trump's very clear, America first. But I think many Americans, they want to know that they are going to be taken care of in this global world. Kind of odd then to have a woman who's been Secretary of State and had more frequent flyer miles than anybody in history be the number one candidate for office right now. Well, then. no, because here's the other aspect of it. Remember, the American president is not just the political leader. The American president is commander in chief. This is a big deal in our system. What would that mean if Hillary Clinton were to be the commander in chief? Well, first woman. So then obviously there are a couple questions. Is she tough enough? Well, you could argue that her record as secretary of state, having been in the situation room when Osama bin Laden was killed, that she has already, of course, been able to stand up to Mr. Mm -hmm. Putin. Uh, she is tough enough. And so all she the... represents a more muscular version of foreign policy than he does. Well, we don't know. His is what I would call a, re a erratic version. Oh, okay. And here, let me explain what it, okay. The big deal is nuclear weapons. And there was a famous ad in 1964, Goldwater versus Johnson. The Daisy ad. The Daisy ad. And I've been showing it in a lot of my speeches. And people are kind of, oh my God, that was incredible. But is it relevant today? Well, it is. Donald Trump has said, well, why do we have nuclear weapons if we can't use them? And one of the issues, and it may be the defining issue that defeats him, is what we call the temperament issue. Does he have the temperament to be commander in chief? And we already have had this unprecedented situation, which more than 70 top Republican foreign policy experts, including former heads of Homeland Security, <clears throat> who've said he doesn't have the temperament. Yeah, but he rolls out his 120 generals and says, I well, got these guys on my side. I, I agree, but we've never had a former deputy director of the CIA endorse the Democratic candidate and say the same thing. And his problems, the issues that he's having now with women, actually play into that argument. Because although that's not about foreign policy, it's about his temperament. OK, but she voted for the war in Iraq. She voted for more aggressive actions in Libya to take down Gaddafi and look, look mm -hmm. at the mess that's been left there. He is arguing. I'm not sure very persuasively, but he argues he was against the war in Iraq, even though he was sort of on tape saying he was for it. She, she does present a more muscular foreign policy vision for America's future. Do you find that at all problematic? Well, she's not a hawk in that sense. I think that's a misreading of who she is. Muscular means that you use all the different tools in America's foreign policy basket to represent America's interests, and I would also argue the best interests of the world. Well, muscular can also mean trigger happy, and well, she's been sh I, seen I, to be that. I would say that's not not true, Steve. No, no that's absolutely not true. And she it said she the, the vote for Iraq was a big mistake. And of course, the invasion by my dear university classmate George Bush of Iraq was one of the worst decisions that we made in foreign policy. You went policy. to university with George Bush? I did. He was my classmate. And uh, where? Yale University. What in year? A, 1968, and I can tell you no one in our class expected him <laughs> to become president of the United States. Neither did he, I can assure <clears throat> you of that. Tell me this, uh, Barack Obama, uh, um, alumnus of your university in California, famously uttered that his foreign policy maxim was, don't do stupid, and then most people clean it up to say stuff. Right. But he said <clears throat> S-H-I-T. What should Hillary Clinton, if she gets there, what should her overarching theme be in the Oval Office as it relates to her being commander in chief? Well, and she said this before, do smart things, do smart stuff. I mean, obviously don't do stupid stuff because that wouldn't be smart, but a smart use of American power and of what I call assertive diplomacy, not simply military power, but economic might, and also make a better use of our foreign service officers, our diplomats. I think that she's because she's been Secretary of State, she understands the value of American diplomacy. Okay, so give us an example. Give me an example of where, when she was Secretary of State, she applied the maxim, let's do smart stuff, and it worked out. Well, the negotiations with Iran. It was her people, her State Department, that initiated and then worked on this, and then Senate Secretary Kerry followed up on it. 
we could have a debate or discussion about whether you think this was good or bad, mm -hmm. but I believe that the nuclear deal with Iran was brought about by us applying smart power, economic sanctions, and we did it with Russian and Chinese support, and that's why it was effective. It was basically global sanctions, not just the U.S. Let me bring up Russia, since you just, or <clears throat> let me follow up on Russia, since you just brought it up. Russia was, I think, the most important foreign policy issue that was covered in the last debate, the first half hour of which was unlike anything I've ever <clears throat> seen before, but that's another story. Let's talk Russia. Roll the clip, please. Russia hasn't paid any attention to ISIS. They're interested in keeping Assad in power. So I, when I was Secretary of State, advocated, and I advocate today, a no-fly zone and safe zones. We need some leverage with the Russians uh, because they're not going to uh, come to the negotiating table for a diplomatic uh, resolution unless there is some leverage over them. And we have to work more closely with our partners and allies on the ground. But I want to emphasize that what is at stake here is the ambitions and the aggressiveness of Russia. Russia has decided that it's all in in Syria, and they've also decided who they want to see become president of the United States, too, and it's not me. Okay, you're a former ambassador. Was that too undiplomatically put? No, I think she was accurate. It was an accurate description of Vladimir Putin's Russia. And I, you know, I've been involved in Russia a long time. I studied Russian. I studied in the country. I worked there. Finland became the EU border with Russia when I was with ambassador there. And so I don't think it's a good thing, but I do think we shouldn't, and Canadians shouldn't either, have any illusions about who Vladimir Putin is and how he behaves. In which case, let me ask you about this. You tell me if I'm pronouncing this properly. Iskander missiles? Iskander missiles were sent to Kaliningrad, the Russian enclave on the Baltic Sea, hmm. last week. That's a little piece of real right. estate that lies between Poland and Lithuania. They are now within range of major Western cities, including Berlin. Because you were the ambassador to Finland, you know this neighborhood very well. How seriously should we regard that development? Well, we should take it seriously. It's not like we're going to start a war over it because, <clears throat> look, Russia's a nuclear power, and that's always been an important issue, and you don't get into shooting wars with other nuclear powers. Obviously, that would be really stupid. Mm -hmm. But it's part of the way Putin operates, and he uses what I call asymmetrical power. He likes to make little maneuvers that are kind of aggressive jabs, but ones that don't totally cross the line that would, like, attack a NATO member, that would really cross the line and then might invite a really aggressive response. I think what, though, is interesting is this unprecedented cyber attacks and in intrusion into an American election. Mm -hmm. That is historic. Um, Trump says it's a 400-pound guy on his couch doing all that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Trump loves it because, obviously, you, if you remember, Republicans hated WikiLeaks. Republicans wanted to hang Julian Assange at a traitor, as a traitor. Now, you know, have, they have Republic. We love Julian Assange. We love WikiLeaks because he's... You know, Democrats are in the crosshairs. Well, yeah, and he's working hand in hand with Russian hackers. Shall we hear from him? Here is Donald Trump, the Republican nominee at last Sunday's debate. Roll it, please. Now she talks tough. She talks really tough against against uh, uh, Putin and against Assad. She talks in favor of the rebels. She doesn't even know who the rebels are. Look at what she did in Libya with Gaddafi. Gaddafi's out. It's a mess. And by the way, ISIS has a good chunk of their oil. I, I'm sure you probably have heard that. It was a disaster. Because the fact is, almost everything she's done in foreign policy has been a mistake and it's been a disaster. So she wants to fight. She wants to fight for rebels. There's only one problem. You don't even know who the rebels are. Mr. Trump, Mr. So what's Trump, the purpose? your two and, minutes is up. And one thing I have to say, your two minutes I don't is like up. Assad at all. But Assad is killing ISIS. Russia is killing ISIS. And Iran is killing ISIS. And those three have now lined up because of our weak foreign policy. In the midst of all of that, is there some truth? No. Almost, every, no, almost everything he said is factually incorrect. But it is a powerful political narrative. Because what he's trying to do is blame the problems of the Middle East, which not only go back to George W. Bush's invasion of Iraq, but before that, on Mrs. Clinton. And also, remember, she was Secretary of State, but the decider was Barack Obama. So I'll just give you an example of a couple points. 
Assad has viciously murdered hundreds of thousands of his own people. It's all mm -hmm. documented. Yep. The Russians have bombed civilians, most recently hospitals in Aleppo. So these are like facts on the ground. And they are not dedicated to fighting ISIS. Neither is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard that's supporting Assad. Now, Assad's not a good guy. Maybe President Obama shouldn't have drawn a line in the sand. Maybe he shouldn't even said, we're going to remove him because of the situation. He's supported by Russia and Iran. Mm. So it's a very difficult situation. We do know who the rebels are. The problem is the rebels are very weak, and there is also ISIS. But the reason is ISIS is because of George Bush's invasion of Iraq. Okay, but the narrative does look, the, the narrative he has put forward looks like this. She voted for the war in Iraq. She screwed up on Libya because she decided to allow the population to take down Gaddafi, and then IS came in, and now it's even worse. She was unable to persuade Barack Obama to bring in a no-fly zone over Syria. Question, are her foreign policy chops overrated? No, I think, you know, as I say, it's a good narrative. I mean, take Libya. England and France initiated the intervention against Libya, mainly for humanitarian reasons. Right. Obama went along, supported the French okay, and the English, and they did it for humanitarian reasons, the same way people might have done in Rwanda or somewhere else mm -hmm. to prevent a bad guy from killing a lot of his own people. But there was no then follow-up or support to go in and sort of rebuild Libya because it had been so much of a failure in Iraq. So <clears throat> yes, she supported it, she supported her president, but I don't think it's all on her. Okay, let's <clears throat> check uh, hmm. some more Pew Research hmm. numbers here. You grab a swig of water in the meantime. Uh, Sheldon, let's bring this up. Word three, how powerful is the United States today? <clears throat> Pew Research <clears throat> look into this. 46% said less powerful than 10 years ago. 31% said as powerful as 10 years ago. 21% said more powerful than 10 years ago. And again, depending on how you look at those numbers, if you add up the second and third, essentially you've got more than half Americans thinking that U.S. prestige in the world is intact. How about on American military spending? More than a third of Americans want it increased. About a quarter want it decreased. 40% says keep it the same. And of those who want more military spending, who are they? Nearly two-thirds are Republicans. About a third are independents. Fewer than one in five is a Democrat. In which case, if Hillary Clinton wins this election, are Americans ready for more global turmoil? Well, there's going to be more global turmoil, whatever we do, because this globalized world with rising nationalism, not only in Russia and China, but in Finland, where there's a true Finn party that's upset about immigration, in Hungary. I mean, there is a lot of turmoil. And the notion that somehow America, through military might, can somehow exercise a power to stop it all, I think is, you know, it's a myth and it's not understanding international relations. The question I would say, really interesting. We don't know the answer. And because of so many Republican foreign policy experts have endorsed Mrs. Clinton, there's a possibility if she wins the election for a bipartisan foreign policy for the United States, something we have not had in decades. Remember, the Republicans almost reflexively attacked everything Barack Obama did. They attacked the Iran deal, attacked the opening with Cuba, attacked everything he'd done in Syria. And they were just being negative. So the interesting question I would have, and we don't know the answer yet, is whether she could then reach across the aisle, and at least with Republican experts, probably not with Tea Party people, forge a bipartisan, smart American foreign policy. Maybe put a, a Republican as defense secretary, something like the, that? Oh, I think that <clears throat> you'll see some top Republicans in her administration in some positions involving national security. I should ask you about how you would answer those questions that Pew Research looked into. Do you think, for example, that the United States is more or less or as powerful today as it was 10 years ago? I think, you know, it's like, what do you mean by powerful? Um, able to project its will around the world. I don't think we have been able to project our will around the world since the end of World War II. Hmm. I think that's just a fact. Uh, obviously, we couldn't project our will in Eastern Europe because the Soviet army was there. We didn't project our will totally in the Korean War because the Chinese army invaded. So that's the reality. America is not some all-powerful giant. 
And what is our influence based on? Yes, we have the most powerful military in the world, but I would also argue we have the best, what we call soft power, that overall our message about American society, when it's at its best, that we welcome people who come here. We're an immigrant-based nation. We take human rights seriously. We take the rights of women seriously. And that our culture, I mean, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for literature. For literature. Now, Bob Dylan is among the best of our culture and rock and roll. When I was ambassador, you know, I hosted Tina Turner's visit. I hosted Johnny Cash. I mean, American culture is incredibly popular around the world. That's part of our power and influence. So I would say overall, America is not less powerful if you take it out of the realm of just military. Hmm. That's a good point. We do need to consider power in, in broader terms. How about on the issue of military spending? More or less about the same? I don't think it's a matter of dramatic increase. Because again, it's about using your military in a smart way. And you can even see with Putin, he's not using a giant army. He's using cybersecurity. I mean, it doesn't cost much to have cyber experts or to move a missile you already have up and around. So, <clears throat> and this is what's contradictory about Putin. He says that we need to increase military spending, but we're not going to use the military. <laughs> We're going to be more isolationist, be at home. So there's a real disconnect in what he's saying about it. But again, it's not, we already have this incredible military. You spend as much as the next nine nations yes, combined. Right. So it's not about the amount, it's about using it smartly. Hmm. In our remaining couple of minutes here, <clears throat> I need to hmm. ask you what if he wins? What then? Well, Canada should be asking this question because he said that he would abrogate the North American Free Trade Agreement. Well, we know he can't do that unilaterally. Yes, he can. Uh, well, he he, he, can he get... could try to do it. Right. He has a lot of power as president in trade agreements. Now, there'd been a lot of pushback. Companies would sue because companies are so integrated across borders. Well, and Congress has a role in that, too. He can't do it with one flick of the pen. Oh, yes, he can. He can do a lot of things. He can start initiatives without Congress. And then, of course, if he wins, he would have control of Congress because he's not going to win and have the Senate or the Congress go Democratic. Uh, how do you know he'd have control of Congress? His, his, re well, his he, Republicanism <clears throat> and the Republican Party, as we traditionally think of it, are two different yeah, entities. Control is a funny word because, yeah. you know, and I've been asked <clears throat> a lot, well, what if he ordered the military, say, to torture people and the military viewed it as illegal? Or what if you wanted to use nuclear weapons? What would happen? Well, that's the stuff of fiction. We don't know. I mean, we know during Nixon and Watergate, Nixon gave some orders. People quit rather than follow the orders. Right. I think it, it would be turmoil. And frankly, American soft power would suffer greatly if President Trump is the representative of the United States. In which case, last question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how desperately are you hoping Hillary Clinton becomes the next president of the United States? <laughs> well, hoping. Uh, I expect her to become the next president of the United States, and I would say over 10. But I also think it's not just important for the U.S. It's important for the world. Because if you look at her program, she's published this. You can buy it here in Canada at the airport, Stronger Together. What she's put forward is a kind of new New Deal which involves also dealing with the downsides, the discontents of globalization, calls for a smart foreign policy. So were she to win and win control of the Senate, then we might, I think, have hopes for a kind of reform of America at home and a smarter foreign policy abroad and a closer partnership with Canada. Because we like your new government, your new prime minister. We have lots of ideas for cooperating with Canada. He's quite the international superstar right now, isn't he? Well, he's very handsome, but he's also got bright people around him. And earlier this week, I was in Ottawa. I talked to a lot of members of your government. We talked a lot about some very interesting initiatives that we might take together um, if Mrs. Clinton wins. We shall stay tuned. That's Derek Shearer, former U.S. ambassador to Finland, now the director of the McKinnon Center for Global Affairs at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Yes, Barack Obama did go there for a couple of years. Ambassador Sher, it's good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.